Welcome, my name is Kristen Evangelista and I am the director of the William Patterson University Galleries. It is my pleasure to have your company for this evening's virtual conversation with artists Marion Wilson and Tat Futan. Both artists are to be commended for graciously adapting to the online presentation of this event and I thank them for their participation. This event is organized in conjunction with the exhibition, Marion Wilson, the landscape is sanctuary to our fears. We are excited to launch the exhibition catalog, which provides valuable documentation of the exhibition that we had to prematurely close due to COVID-19. I'm happy to share a link to a digital version of the catalog and hard copies are available upon request. I would like to thank all of those who assisted in making this exhibition and publication possible. First and foremost, I would like to thank Marian Wilson for her unwavering vision and dedication to this project. For their assistance in the realization of this endeavor, I am grateful to gallery manager Emily Johnson, collections manager Casey Mathern, graduate assistant Taylor Cassisi, and intern Kara Kovach. The publication features an insightful essay by guest writer Jane Harris, exceptional photographs by Jessica Talos, and was thoughtfully designed by Matt Bartolucci. This exhibit was supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as ongoing support from the New Jersey State Council for the Arts. Tonight, we have invited artists Marion Wilson and Tap Futan to speak with us about their recent publications. Both artists share an interest in ecological justice and have collaborated on several projects. First, I would like to briefly introduce each artist. Marion Wilson's art investigates ecology and landscape to foster a closer connection to self and place. Through photographs, paintings, and installations, she interrogates our relation to nature at a time when extreme climate change threatens ecosystems, livelihoods, and communities. Tat Futan is an artist who collaborates with the public on issues related to ecology, sustainability, and healthy living. His work is project-based, ephemeral, and educational in nature. This virtual conversation will explore commonalities in their work, in particular, their investigations of our connection to nature. In his book, Heal Humankind in Order to Heal the Land, Tap Futan presents introspective strategies that enable us to reconnect to nature as we face climate change and find inspiration and spirituality across different cultures. Marian Wilson's recent project at William Patterson University is titled, The Landscape is Sanctuary to Our Fears, implying that nature is a place of refuge. She is exploring, quote, whether art can save nature and whether nature can save us from ourselves. Each artist will now offer a short presentation and then I will pose a few questions to both artists. This will be followed by questions that the audience can share using the chat window in YouTube. We will also be responding to questions posed on social media. Without further ado, I would like to turn to Marian Wilson. Good evening. Kristen has invited me to talk about three projects. Landscape is Sanctuary to Our Fears, the installation at William Patterson University Galleries, The Lake Project, and Moss Lab. And I'll begin with Landscape. Normally, I don't start with this more personal part of the exhibition, but rather I end with it. But considering the profound time in which we live, it seems to s appropriate to start with the personal. I begin with a painted portrait of myself and my sisters, who as young girls were brought into politics of the 1960s, which are referenced in this exhibition, because of my father's campaigns. For this exhibition, I created a site-specific installation interweaving my paintings with historical artifacts and, and new photographs. I made a historic link between the 1913 silk strike in Patterson, New Jersey, and the 1960s 
in New York City when I was drawn into politics as a child by my activist parents living in New York City before we moved to New Jersey. My father, Jerome L. Wilson, was a New York State Senator from 1963 to 1966 before he ran for Congress. Right as I finished this year-long project, my father died. So this point in time, living in solitude, holds particular resonance for me. Starting in spring 2019, I collaborated with Nicole Davy, a William Patterson University professor of environmental science, as well as undergraduate students, to conduct stream studies of the Passaic watershed. Together, we examined microinvertebrates, which are bioindicators of water quality, as well as overlooked and underappreciated aspects of our landscape. Over the course of subsequent months, I conducted my own field hikes all around Patterson, New Jersey, to the library, to the historical museum, and looking through my father's political archives, the labor museum, studying political history, and all the while collecting water samples in small bottles. A major focus of the exhibition is the series, The Waters of My Childhood, a photographic series documenting water collecting from lakes that I visited and swam in regularly as a child. I collaborated with scientists on this and many other projects, and several people have told me that presenting figures and facts does not necessarily increase general public's awareness about or interest in combating climate change. Rather, sensory experiences like art can and do get people interested. The waters that I swam in as a child were beautiful, and every day people are more likely to respond to this and everyday people are more likely to respond to this beauty in nature and have had similar experiences and memories. Even in the algae blooms, like in Lake Apakong, which of course are a result of a warming planet, are in fact beautiful, but there is also a dark side to their beauty. I am interested in exploring the dichotomy in art between abjection and beauty. Mylar, water, light, all the materials I am I'm using is to me about memory. And these materials seem to be the material for memory. I'm making connections between three time periods and collapsing these time periods through the materials I use to speak to that. I am very attached to the material quality of disciplines, and I choose whichever is necessary. Drawing and painting for me are both a form of observing, getting close, being intimate, and channeling my subjects. I tried to impose that same intimacy when I collected the lake waters, when I made the photographs and chose to print them on a milky, hand-painted mylar. The same goes with the historical artifacts. I used which materials resonate with me and the feeling of past and present, the old wood next to the reflective plexi frames, the patterns of the jacquard cards, that create shadows on the wall. The importance of the water, the Patterson Falls in Patterson, New Jersey, became an invitation to explore the issue of memory in a new way. In William Carlos Williams' long form poem, Patterson, he said, the city is a man. And in this exhibition, I am claiming the city as a woman. How does one define a city? Through its memory, through its spirit, through its human histories, through land and its water. This project is not only about the city of Patterson. However, what happened in Patterson, where the water was the engine for industry, immigration, the labor movement, but protests, children and women working and striking, you could think of it as a launching off point as it reminded me of my own history in childhood, and it is certainly relevant to the rest of the country today. The Lake Project A few years back, 
another faculty member and I declared ourselves artists in residence along the shores of Onondaga Lake and gained entry into 1,400 square feet of the contaminated Solve waste beds. While I painted miniature landscape on recycled photography glass, Sarah McCubrey and I also taught a studio art class that took as its subject matter Onondaga Lake, at one time declared the dirtiest lake in North America. Onondaga Lake, until recently, was the elephant in the living room. Except for a few pockets of environmental scientists, the city nor the campus did not talk much about the lake. The lake, meanwhile, tells the entire history of the city, as water frequently does, its plant and fish population, industrial waste, and sewage and salt. In the Lake Project class, the student used performances of washing clothes in the lake, interviews of jogging pedestrians, and fabricated scenic viewing stations to explore through their senses one of the city's most telling histories. And the final image here by a young artist named Samantha Harmon plopped a for sale sign in the middle of the lake, putting Lake Onondaga up for sale. Lucy Lepard in Lore of the Local says architects create space, whereas artists create place. Feeling a sense of place and the mindset of these college students with whom we worked would seem to be inherently contradictory. Most students that arrive in a city like Syracuse or Wayne, New Jersey, for that case, I would think until recently never thought about the needs or issues of that place, and nor do they give it a second thought after they leave. An outcome of my residency along Onondaga Lake and this class was to instill a sense of rootedness within an inherently transient population, and much of the work has grown out of my own desire for a sense of rootedism. At that time, to stop running to New York City from upstate New York, and rather to address the landscape and context in which I lived. Thank you very much, Marianne, for sharing that um, thoughtful overview of your work with us. Um, if there are any questions about uh, Marion's work, if they are posted in the chat window on YouTube, uh, we could respond to them now. Um, but um, perhaps, Marion, you would like to say something? I just wanted to say hello. We don't, we don't know who's here, but I know that I have a, a few friends here from the present and the past. And I just wanted to say hi and, um, uh, you know, in this stay in place time, we don't see real bodies. So it's great to be present. So, Marion, maybe I could ask you a question um, before we go on to Tapu's presentation. Um, would you be interested in telling us a little bit about the projects that you're working on next? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a little, uh, I'm, I'm doing a project about about food, and um, I, it is something that I started earlier. But it, but I, you know, I just moved into a new studio up on up in East Harlem, and I haven't been able to get to my regular studio as as many people haven't been able to. So, so things have shifted a little bit. But I, um, and I've started to like look within my own surroundings and kitchen and so on and so forth. To, to think about what I what, what I could do right here. I had started a project when I was um, working on the Patterson project and the water project where I was um, storing all my food and my compost in the freezer and was photographing it. And this, this weird kind of um, hoarding mentality where you're just kind of like looking around your surroundings actually has was almost like prescient because um, now I'm expanding off on, on that, that work, that body of work, and it takes on a, a new meaning now in the context of the virus. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have another question um, from the audience, um, which is, could you tell us more about your use of natural materials in your work? Yeah, I mean, I've always been, um, I've always, I've always given myself great liberty in the materials that I use. Um, you know, I was, I was trained as a painter, uh, but, you know, I used, I've used other things to, other liquid materials in the stead of paint um, and called them painting. Um, for example, in this ink, there's, there's actually walnut ink that's made by Tat Futan, the flag that you saw is actually made, um, it looks like blood, but it's actually Tat Futan's walnut ink. Um, so I tend to pick materials that have the conceptual resonance that is important to me. Thank you. We have another question. Um, another um, viewer would like to know the meaning of the red mulberry tree. Um, could you share how you came up with that um, image and its color? Yeah. So the, the mulberry tree uh, was important because it's the food source for the silkworm. And um, raw silk was actually shipped over from China, but at first they tried to um, grow it right in Patterson. And so I knew that I wanted to paint a large mulberry tree for the entrance of the show. And I ended up using a uh, pretty well-known image by Vincent van Gogh. And I, I kind of used that as an inspiration for my own uh, silk-infested um, mulberry tree. I, you know, I made one in green and then I wanted to make one in red, which is just the complementary color I wanted, I wanted to together. I don't know that there's any specific meaning to um, the color red other than it's the, the opposite of green. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're going to take this one more question and then we're going to transition over to Tapu's presentation. Um, so uh, we have a question from Professor Nicole Davi, who was a valuable con uh, collaborator and um, contributor to this project. And um, Marion, she would like to know um, what of your work resonates the most with the, aud the public, to public audiences? I, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, certainly you, you had mentioned that you thought it was the paintings that were the most resonant. And it's interesting because uh, uh, I, I've only recently started making larger paintings and exhibiting them. It was almost like a kind of secret act that I was engaged in. Um, I don't know. I think that, I think, I think it's the process for in which I do research and make something in this gallery. Like, like I think the fact that I learned from you how to collect macroinvertebrates and bottled them and then turned them into photographs. I mean, I think it's the way I kind of borrow from other disciplines to make my art that might be intriguing for people. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering these questions, and thank you to the audience for um, contributing to this dialogue. Okay, we're, now we are going to shift um, to Tat Fu, and he is going to tell us about his um, project. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tat Fu, and I thank you for being here with me today. Uh, I'm an artist, and my practice deals with ecology, sustainability, and climate change. And I collaborate with the public to make art projects. Uh, they are usually very much uh, DIY, and I publish a syllabus so that other people could replicate my project in other places. Um, my trilogy of project, uh, first of them is called Nature Matching System, where I encourage people to eat colorful fruits and vegetables. They are being reminded by using a placemat, and sometimes they are being painted as murals uh, in different places. Actually, I have a collaboration with uh, my co-speaker today, uh, Marion, uh, and we did a project at, uh, in Syracuse in a school. So this is a good resources if you like to encourage people to eat healthy. 
The second project is called SOS, Sustainable Organic Stewardship, where I decided to learn how to make a garden. Since I like to eat healthy, I might as well learn to grow my own food. So I learned how to compost, how to set up a garden through the ideas and design philosophy of permaculture, and I uh, became basically a steward for the earth. And with all this knowledge that I gather, I make patches and wear them like a uniform. And, as, and this is the book where you will find uh, all the resources where you can be helpful to the earth. Recycling, composting, permaculture, different ways of gathering a community together and build a better neighborhood. Uh, currently, there is a show in um, Gracie Mansion uh, on this project called uh, SOS Free Seat Library. Obviously, it's closed right now due to COVID-19, but afterwards, when this uh, stay-in uh, mandatory thing has been lifted, feel free to check it out in um, Gracie Mansion in Manhattan. And after these two projects, I see that uh, the world is not changing, uh, the leaders is not making any improvement and business as usual. So I figured I might as well learn to survive in case what they call uh, shit hits the fan. Basically, we come towards a, a very bad situation, almost like what we are facing right now. So uh, the first thing that I learned is physical survival. And I went to a survival school in New Jersey where I've been taught how to survive building shelters, procurement of water and food, uh, even camouflage myself to hunt and start a fire and things like that. So I made another resource called uh, New Earth Resiliency Training Module. And this is basically uh, a survival guide, like a Boy Scout guide or an outdoorman's guide about survival in the wild. Um, this project was very useful and um, and but I noticed something that is a problem. Everyone talk about survival is only physical survival, but when you try to survive physically, there is a fear that that consume you because what you are trying to survive is to preserve the body, not really your true self. And that fear over consume myself, and I hate being fearful. So I want to make sure. If I could survive physically, I wanted to be without fear. As you can see a lot in the media, you can see that people call preppers that they are like survivalists and they have, uh, they have bunkers and a lot of shells, stable food that they hoard. Um, almost like people hoarding toilet paper nowadays. Uh, so what's going on is that people are fearful because they're trying to survive. So, Survival is not about just surviving physically, you also have to survive spiritually. So in, in, in places like, in, in situations like a pandemic right now, sometimes you, this book probably won't be useful to you that much because you can't see what's going on. So it's just the germs, the virus that is flying around. So you might have to accept the ultimate truth, which is that we are not in control. And since you're not in control, you might be infected and die and lost your body. So that is something that we have to bring forth and not try to uh, bluff ourselves that that's not going to happen. So in order to be able to live, uh, to live to the fullest that I could, I also wanted to be able to die the fullest that I could. So that leads me to the idea of uh, spiritual survival. And when this uh, project called Heal the Man in order to heal the land uh, started, so it's basically this, this two is like, uh, book one and book two, physical, physical survival and spiritual survival. And um, being someone that has no particular strong religious background, so I'm free to explore different uh, wisdom uh, teaching uh, of the world. And I see that as a good thing because you can uh, pick and choose what makes sense to you and try them out and maybe you can combine them. Uh, just like an artist, you can combine different colors to paint on your palette and make a beautiful painting. And as I explore different traditions, and they all make sense because they all came from the single source. And they are just being 
interpreted differently, different languages, different ethnic uh, belief, uh, custom. So they, they look different, but if you look closely, examine them closely, you'll find that they are all the same. Anyway, so the book is uh, cut into two, separated into two different sections. One is called Duality, which is me and you, the viewer, are two separate entities, obviously. Um, but through duality, we need to be able to understand that we are not truly separated, but we are interconnected, right? Like we are, we need the trees, the minerals, the air, the animals to survive. Without them, we can't, we can't survive on our own. So we are not really uh, an individual that are cut from other things. So we are, we are interconnected. Uh, that is the basic that we have to understand. Uh, ecological problem uh, occurring due to this misunderstanding that we are special and we don't. Uh, everything else is under our domain, where else like n not really as this uh, particular pandemic has been showing us. But the next step to to get rid of fear is you have to understand what is non-dual. Basically, the idea of non-dual is that in the, in the physical outlook of duality and diversity, there is a single thing that is pervading in everything. So basically, there is not just not two, but there's even not one. It's non-dual. Uh, everything is just one thing. And that one thing is undescribable. So, um, so this is how uh, the book has been separated, and it goes. Um, usually, I run a, a ritual or a ceremony for people to get them slowly talk about all these uh, complicated things. And you can find different type of exercise and suggested uh, and suggested projects that slowly, slowly bring you to the realization that you are non-dual. Um, one of the tools that I've been practicing and really uh, liked is the tarot card or the oracle cards because it is like a mini museum that you can hold in your hand and it has tons of history and there is new decks being created every day. So I have my own deck uh, here you can, you can find them uh, in the book. You can print them up, cut them, and play with them. And uh, what you call it, the, the key or the, or, the, or the meanings are being explained in all the pages. So the tarot brings me to, uh, to research more of different type of uh, wisdom teaching. So that is one way that I get entered into the spiritual realm. Um, so you can find different ways, whatever that you like. And I have a, a great uh, blessings that I found a, a personal guru that will guide me through uh, my path. So that is a plus. Um, but there is tons of resources online that will help you and guide you through. Um, the biggest question that we ask is, who am I? And I think this is the case of mistaken identity. We think we are our name and we think we are the body which if you look closely, we are not our name because we didn't born with it and we are not our body because the body has been given to us. Even our father and mother doesn't know how to make a human. They are a tools that humans are born. So basically the body belongs to the earth where the earth grows everything and it just happens spontaneously. Do we really have free will? Um, I felt that we only have optional choices that we mistaken as free will and uh, that's what happened. You are not really a body with consciousness but your consciousness experiencing a body. So basically you, the way you felt yourself is not true material, it doesn't mean, meaning that you are not being trapped in a material world. 
Maybe this one is good. Understanding life is not serious. Nothing has its inherent meaning. If you if you can see this, you'll take life easier and you can let go of things easier. Because if you take everything serious, then you get stuck. You're not happy. You are not really a human being. Basically, that you are not a being, but you are a being in human. You are being human. You are more than a human. Inherently, there is no good and bad, only skillful and unskillful action. Because if you label things as good and bad, you fight them because there is, you want to be good, you don't want to be bad. But if you see them as just as the nature of things and categorize them more of a skillful and unskillful action, and when you perform unskillful action, you create more suffering. So let's try not to do that. This is a big one. There is no linear time. We live in an eternal now. If you can truly understand that we are not really moving from the past to the future, but we are running on the spot like a treadmill of a timeline that is eternal now, 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 now. And you look and you think a little bit about it. Any being that can live in an eternal now has to be an eternal being. Your body might shed, but your being is ever eternal. And we are all one. That there is no two. We are all one. Only one exists. So basically I'm talking to myself. That's basically the philosophy. So back in my uh, studio, this is a homeschool classroom that I have. I've been learning uh, Sanskrit and teaching them at the same time as I do learn, practice, teach. And also another friend is teaching ancient Greek. So it's a good, it's a good uh, match. Anyway, so um, this is basically the idea of having a social practice where you know you collaborate with people and. Uh, and do something together. So please follow me on all social media and also if you like a physical copy of the book you can buy it at the Concern Newsstand and you can of course download it for free on my website all the three or the four books that I mentioned just now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much Tattoo for um Hi, my name is... I appreciate your comments uh, about our current situation and um, COVID and how to make our way through this situation that we find ourselves in. Um, so I um, really have quite a few questions um, to share with you. Thank you very much to the audience for um, listening so carefully um, um, and responding. I'm going to first pose a couple questions to Tapu from the audience. Um, and then we will have more conversation between both Marion and Tatfu. So if your question isn't answered right away, please um, be patient. We've seen them all and we will get to them. Um, so um, we have one question from the audience. Um, um, someone would like to know, Tatfu, if you are familiar with forest bathing, it is a meditative technique in nature. Yes, uh, Senrin Yuku, I think it's called in Japanese and in Chinese. Uh, it's a great technique to get back to nature and if you couldn't go to a forest, the, the easiest way is just go out to, a, to your backyard or even a patch of land anywhere that you, are connect, that you can have bare feet and really have bare feet connected to raw grass or raw dirt. Just stand there for five minutes. Uh, it has almost a similar effect as going to an actual forest. It's basically to, uh, grounding yourself but of course if you go to a forest you have more uh, you get more benefit you are in touch with nature more uh, and um, one of the best ways is also go to the beach because it has negative ion it automatically automatically makes you happy it's kind of a magical thing um, that's why i uh, i go surfing at rockaway even though i'm not good at it but i just sit in the surfboard out there watching the whales puffing their ass makes me happy um, so, yeah, so if forest doesn't work for you, go to the beach. 
Thank you. Um, so we have another question um, which relates to the um, nature matching system. Um, and the question is, um, how did you come up with the disposable table mat? Does the table mat have the whole food pyramid or just the fruits and veggies? Uh, the table mat, uh, at first it was uh, paper and then I make it into plastic so it's not really disposable. Um, and then um, it's only printed the sort of like um, pixelated colors that was inspired by food and vegetables. So it's basically about eating phytonutrients, nutrients that are coming from colors. So I'm not talking about the food pyramid being eating proteins and other things like that, but basically eating a colorful meal that are automatically makes you healthy, a meal that are colorful because it is minimally processed, minimally cooked. And in that case, you don't, want to, you don't need to worry too much about a certain diet, but just eating colorful makes you happy too. Thank you. We have another question um, for you, Tatfu. Um, do you think um, your work is equal parts physical and spiritual um, in order to overcome these challenges, or does one um, outweigh the other? Well, the physical survival book is basically what I call rewilding, because as human, we are domesticated, so we are kind of weak right now. So it's a process of rewilding, reconnect back to our ancestral knowledge that we lost. So we are just gaining back the knowledge. So those things, uh, because by going out into, into nature, you, you can see it's all around you, all the material, all you need to survive supposed to be that you, you are not supposed to be relying on the supermarket to give us food. You know, the food should be there, but because our society through the generation, we sort of domestic make ourselves a domestic creature instead of a, a wild creature, like how we domestic a dog, the walk, the dog would be very hard to survive out in nature if they were released back. So that is the physical survival. Uh, it's great to do that because you appreciate nature more if you learn all those things that your ancestor know. That's why we, every time we are in, in a group, in a, what you call it, a, a, a bonfire, we all automatically become happy. And uh, every time I hold a bow somehow, a bow and arrow, somehow I felt connected to my ancestor. Um, so the spiritual part is really after physical survival because it is, the, the spiritual part is truly trying to figure out who you, who you truly are. Um, that, that is always... Um, when everyone has everything that they need to, to survive, like I do, I, I have a place to stay, I have food to eat, you know, the other way to get more happier than that is to find out who you truly are through spiritual uh, inquiry. So, uh, yes, I'm greedy. I want to be super happy. So that's why I practice uh, spiritual practices. Thank you very much um, for your thoughtful answers, Tatfu. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask you, um, either, either Tapu or Marion could respond to, um, but I wanted to find out a little bit more about how um, you met and your past collaborations and how they've impacted your practice. Do you want me to start, Tatfu? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've known Tatfu maybe for a decade, and uh, one of the things I admired about him was that he was an artist who actually really lived his practice. Um, he has like an urban farm on Staten Island and I actually, I lived there for four months when I was doing a residency at Governor's Island. Um, and uh, the, the way that I met Tat Food was we were invited on a, 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 some panels together and I'll never forget, like I would do like a carefully prepared PowerPoint of images and Tapfu would show up with a live chicken. And I, I, and I remember he was a very tough act to follow. So um, that, that was one early memory. But, but I, uh, I, the, the project that, that Tatfu, I invited Tatfu, I was a professor up at Syracuse University and I, I ran a, um, a pretty in-depth uh, art design, architecture, uh, social practice curriculum. And we invited Tat Fu up to do a, um, one of his nature matching systems with 
a uh, an urban grocery store and a bilingual school and a college class. And Tepfu is like a brilliant. I mean, he's super hands on and he lives on a farm, but he's also like really good at technology. And a lot of the way that he uh, imagined his engagement with the public was through open source. So his curriculum was actually open source. And what we did as a class was like really turn it into um, lesson plans and in, and engage it with an entire third grade. Um, and a nutrition nutrition education and an art education with an entire third grade of a school, and then built out a nature matching system. So, um, so yeah, we've known each other for a while. Thank, Thank you. you. Tapu, do you have any thoughts you want to share? Or? Um, yeah, it was a great project back in Syracuse, my first time going upstate and uh, those friendship uh, remains and uh, with the students so it was great uh, collaboration between me and and Marion sorry um, thank you Tapu and Marion so we have another question um, from the audience um, professor Davi uh, would like to know um, what you're doing during the quarantine in terms of are you making work that's related to the quarantine as this becoming something that you're interested in responding to or or are you just need an escape from art? I can uh, answer that one. I am. Uh, I just finished a three uh, two months long Sanskrit class to learn. Um, a foreign um, script, uh, the Deva Nagari script, and that just finished. And I today I just paid for another nine months long uh, course in in further Sanskrit study. So yes, yeah, so all my uh, quarantine time is studying a foreign language, basically. Uh, yeah. So the first the first three weeks of the the quarantine, I was actually sick, and um, and now I'm better. And one of the things that I'm I'm really sensitive to, as I said, I, my studio is a little bit makeshift. I have like a bit of this and that here at my house where I am. Um, but one of the things I'm really sensitive to are elderly people that are alone. And you know, it's kind of a well, it's not kind of. It's a it's a completely overlooked population and. You know, my mom and I have many friends and the people that have died in nursing homes. My mom is, um, you know, she's pr she's probably been alone maybe up to like 48 days. And she said something really, which is, relates to this food project that I'm doing. She said this, um, she said to me, she's getting Meals on Wheels. So Meals on Wheels is her only connection, really. And because um, I couldn't visit her for a while. And, and she said to me the other day, you know, I think I want to go back up to New Hampshire from New Jersey where she is because the Meals on Wheels are better up there, which I, which is like a very, um, like this is what we've come to, <laughs> you know, kind of statement. Um, anyway, so I've been making these, uh, like for me, even though I've done these big, large social projects like renovating buildings and making a mobile lab and that kind of thing, it always begins with drawing. Like drawing to me is a language that crosses over between people. So I've started dyeing all these um, papers and pages with vegetable dye. I mean, it sounds really corny and Easter egg dyeish or whatever, but it, it really means a lot to me. And I've been dyeing all these papers and made this like key of foods and, and sending them out to, to grandmothers and they're sending recipes back on these uh, dyed papers. And now I'm sending them to other artists who want to interact with them as well. So it's just a way, it's like a stay in place drawing project that I'm doing with senior citizens and artists, friends and writers. Long answer. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marian. Um, so we have another question um, from um, Professor uh, Midori Yoshimoto, who I don't know if you know, but she's the gallery director at New Jersey City University oh, yeah. Galleries. Um, and she wants to know if you are doing any online team teaching during the quarantine. Uh, I, I'm 
I don't know, team teaching with each other, you mean, or am I teaching online? I am, I am teaching, and th that's actually, it's, it's great, because I'm, I'm teaching a class at um, Montclair State University that I've taught for several years, and it's on color. So suddenly I have these, uh, this amazing group of students who are also home, many without their supplies. So actually the real reason why I started making these vegetable dyes and natural pigments was because I was practicing what I was going to assign to the students. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's weird to be teaching an entire Zoom class. I feel like a cheerleader in, in, um, in some ways. Uh, you know, I, I hate when they don't show me their face and they just have their name. But, you know, a, a big, it's on, it's on teacher's shoulders to really, to really um, connect with college students. I mean, I, I, I feel for college students, you know, right now. And, and kids in general who have to suddenly be out of school and learn online. I don't know if that's the answer, but... Are you doing teaching, Tatfu? Are you teaching? Uh, I'm doing small project with a few uh, organization. Um, this uh, this Saturday, I'm doing a, a little mini intro workshop with uh, Staten Island uh, Museum on the Earth Day Education platform on YouTube. Um, I'm going to teach a tarot card with a McCall Center for Arts oh. online. Yeah. Um, things like that that are like small scale, really quick. Um, right. Yeah. And, and you're doing something tomorrow with um, Go Art Space All Day Celebration, right? Oh, of, yes. Of Earth Day. Of, day. Of day. Yeah. I'm do a meditation and uh, and and introduce my book too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, did you want me to answer my question? Did you, or sure, absolutely. <laughs> kind of wait. <laughs> no, no. It's whatever. I I just um I. Knowing your work, I mean, I, I knew the, the phase of survival and growing food and and um, and that. And and so when I first heard about the spiritual part, I was I was surprised. I mean, that that there was that's a new but it makes perfect the way you were talking about it, like like the fear. I mean, I think the fear is, um, well, it's certainly something we all feel now. Um, but the way you talk about how that was something that led you to the kind of spiritual practice. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I, my entry point to art was painting sunset and river scenes in, in nice uh, bucolic places in my childhood. You know, I just bike to a river and a, a stream and then sit there for hours trying to capture the scene. That's my, that's my passion when I was 10 years old to maybe 15 and then went to college. And then, um, so, so that, was, that was my first love. Basically, I love nature, I guess, like appreciation to, to see things in nature, to worship nature. And then when I moved to um, nature matching system, it's still worshiping nature in another way. I didn't notice it, but it's still about colors of nature, how beautiful they are when you see those fruits and vegetables in farmer's market. And then when I move into SOS, sustainability, uh, uh, sustainable organic stewardship, it's also working with nature, like doing more in-depth work in nature, how composting is so beautiful and how things break down. And, and I don't have those knowledge growing up. I, I wasn't raised in a rural area, so, I did, so everything is brand new to me. But it's also a way to understand nature more. And then, of course, into the new earth physical survival part is also understanding how to use material from nature that we need to survive every day, which we lost, uh, as I mentioned earlier. But then uh, the whole thing is actually in awe with nature and be nature be my teacher, be my guru, right? So that, that sense is when it shifts to the spiritual part. So art is a way to see things it's a better way to see things using art, but spirituality is seeing things, see the nature of things. You know, it's not just the aesthetic of it, but why is it? You know, like why? What is this? The nature of it. So I'm not just seeing the physical part of it. I'm seeing like the whole. Like uh, if you have a website, I'm, I don't want to see the interface. I want to see the back end of it. You know, so that's how spirituality is it. Um, so when you see the back end, the back engine of the aesthetic part, you'll be in awe. Like, so, 
so that 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 hooked me into spirituality because it is way beautiful than the physical manifestation of nature. Thank so in, in a in, in a in in other uh, in other way is also not just searching for aesthetic thing is also searching for love in some way in a bigger way you know so um, yeah you can talk more about that thank you thank you tap food do you want to ask your question for Marion now yes uh, I have probably a, maybe two part questions uh, the first part is uh, I know of your, you have a practice of a studio practice where you like to paint and then you also practice that are more uh, public, a social practice, uh, project based, uh, working with people and how, how do you manage those two sort of like uh, very separate uh, skill set, I would say. And uh, the other part, the, the second part question is that you also have two types of lifestyle, I could say. Like sometimes you live in a, a location for years and then at some point you were nomadic. I see you move around the country a little bit, it's kind of interesting. So maybe you can talk about that as the lifestyle of artists. In some way. Um, okay, yeah, those are, those are great. And those are great questions. And it, it's really interesting because I think they, they lead me to the arrow of this exhibition and this opportunity to, to work with Kristen and to be in... Patterson and be, to be in New Jersey. Um, you know, uh, not everyone knows the, the social practice projects, but I, I don't actually see them as entirely separate. I recognize that they, um, whoops, whoops, there's so many things happening on the screen. I, I recognize that they um, appear as separate. And when I started this year's project, I thought to myself, okay, Am I going to do a community-based project in Patterson? I mean, that was an option, right? And I and I it has been um, so long since I've really been able to devote like an entire year just to my own studio work and like the inside of my own brain that I I decided I decided to go solo. You know, it, it was like no, I'm going solo, and in doing so, it was very interesting for me to find out. Because by going solo, I really looked at my own autobiography, and that's how I ended up at my dad. Like, how is it I be, am as comfortable on the street talking to people as I am in the studio? How is it that that it was always a seamless part of my project, my, my practice? Like, politics, engagement, sending people things, buying things, going out, leaving campus, going downtown. I didn't know any other way. I mean, I was, there's a photograph in the show of a small three-year-old standing at my dad's campaign table in East Harlem. My sisters and I debate which daughter it is. I mean, I'm one of four girls. It doesn't matter which one it is. But that was my childhood. Like, that was my home life. My home life was on the street, my father's career, politics. That was it. You know, that was my, and so it, it's natural. Like, so people call that social practice. I just call that life. And by doing my own work and returning to New Jersey where I grew up and returning to New York where I grew up, it's like I found my own history. So, so that's a really interesting question. Then this transient thing, you know, that's the same in a way, you know, like when we, we you're transient. I mean, you have this, um, and now we're all learn. I feel like we're all catching up to the way Tatfu leads his life. Like Tatfu, Tatfu didn't fly. He didn't believe in flying. Well, none of us should be flying, right? I mean, now we know that. Um, well, we knew it before, but we weren't doing it. Uh, you know, these projects. I was invited because of my work at Syracuse University and more in the city. I was invited to other cities for several years at a time or a year at a time to do a to embed myself in a neighborhood and do a collaborative project. So I did that for nine months in Charlotte um, th with an art place grant. I did a project with people experiencing homelessness right downtown. Then I went for three years to Philadelphia um, and did a project in North Philly in mural arts. Um, but also, you know, I was just looking for a new home because I, I, my job ended at Syracuse University, all that work I was doing shut down. 
and I wanted to know where I wanted to go next. So everything kind of flowed together. And I landed where I want to be, which is in New York and northern New Jersey. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. And uh, I've been self-quarantining for the past three years, so everyone is following my footsteps for sure. It's, I really feel like even I got to show you my compost work yeah. because it's, <laughs> It's like, it's, it's, it's like, oh, I'm catching up to Tat Fu. <laughs> Thank you both uh, for those um, responses. Uh, we have another question from the audience. Um, do either of you have ideas about what work you might make when you reemerge into the public um, and a place of physical interchange? I mean, that's a, for me, you want me to go first, Tafu, or you want yes, to answer? Yeah, okay, do. I'll go, I'll answer that. I don't think there's any reemerging from this. Like, there's no going back. And that's just not as an artist. I think that's as a human. I don't think there's any going back from this global virus and what we've learned as a species living with this. I, I see this as like an autocorrect. You know, this is a, a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a devastating uh, wake-up call that the way we've been living our lives is wrong. And that's not an answer to what, I mean, I'm going to keep working on the project that I'm working on with composting and food and, but, but there, you know, like we, we all will emerge from this. I think we emerge from this different. Um, I do not have a project that is uh, that I know of in the future, but uh, since I am really much engaged and diving deeper into spirituality, so maybe something connected to that. And since I check my library often, I have an online catalog because uh, I like <laughs> things in order uh, of my books and my books on uh, mysticism and spirituality is overtaking my art book. So obviously that's my path to go in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you both. Um, we have another question from the audience. Um, hold on a minute. Let me just make sure I'm reading the question. Um, Tapu mentioned art being about love, um, and um, the viewer is wondering if that resonated um, to Marion in her exhibition about Patterson, especially in how the personal meets the social. Well, the thing I thought, yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you for picking up on that, because, you know, there's something that Tafu said about like aesthetics. The way he talked about nature is the way I think about painting. Like, I, I don't think I think about painting as an aesthetic practice. I think I think about it as a practice of the spirit. And that's why I keep doing it. You know, even if I'm, even if I don't always show them, like that is how I, um, that's how I that's how I come to know something. That's how I come to know my subject matter. That's how I become intimate with something. And it's a it's a language that's it's a language like nature that speaks back to me, that like does have to work. And it's the only thing other than nature that that does that, you know, in that in that kind of unspeakable way. And that is like love, right? That's love. That, that kind of intimacy and connection. I don't know if that answered the question. But... No, uh, that was, uh, that was a, a good answer, yeah. Um, so we're gonna take uh, one more question and then we're going to wrap up this conversation. Um, I just want to thank everyone for participating, for viewing um, the conversation. I really appreciate all the thoughtful um, questions we've had. Um, and um, so 
um, we have one um, question here. Um, someone wants to know if either of you have gotten lost while spending time in nature. Um, yeah. And if so, how did you find your way out? Oh, you really lost. I uh, I never lost in nature because I usually I research the place really well before I go or or a guide that who brings me there know the place really well so I never really get in trouble <laughs> in nature. Uh, you know, there's that great uh, book by Rebecca Solnit about uh, getting lost. I can't remember what the title is, but so what? Okay. Oh, okay. I, I can't remember the exact title, but it's about getting lost. Wonderlust. Okay. Um, so I believe in getting lost. However, I'm like a, a like a deeply urban person. So if I got, I, I've never been lost in nature. That that would absolutely terrify me. I do on a regular get lost in cities. However, like on purpose. Like I just go out and walk around and wander around and. I don't wander around. I just get lost. And then it takes hours and then I find my way back. But I've never been lost in nature. Yeah, uh, please don't get lost in nature. Nature nature is great, but it has it, it needs to be respected. So please be really vigilant. Go into a woods or something like that. That's a good question. Has this person ever been lost in nature? <laughs> I'm so curious about that question. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, well, um, I want to um, conclude our conversation today. Um, I want to thank um, Marion and Tapu um, for all the insight that you've offered us about how we can find assessments and art and a way forward um, in this precarious moment that we're in um, and for sharing your practice um, um, and insight with us. I've really enjoyed it and I'm grateful to the audience um, for um, engaging in this dialogue with us. Um, and I also want to thank um, the staff at William Patterson who helped facilitate this. Um, we have a wonderful team of technical support from Greg Matheson Brian Gorski, Dante Portella, and Peter Canarazzi. Um, so um, thank you so much um, for joining us. And um, please um, stay tuned um, to the gallery's website, um, as well as Facebook and Instagram. We will be posting um, uh, links to um, Marion's exhibition catalog. And also, um, you can contact the gallery, and we will be um, sending copies out um, in the mail. Um, but it's been a pleasure being with you all this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.